How are you? Good, good, good. I rushed in my scooter. I had slides, but I was so late to give it to Rachel that she didn't make it. Um, I actually don't know what I'm going to talk about because I do everything. Um, so should I just start by telling you a little bit about me and then I could, you know, just have a bit of interaction with you. I am Samantha Hugh and I have a PhD in medical science. And why I say that is because I actually don't have a PhD in medical science. I have a PhD in a lot of sciences, which falls into medical science. I have cancer research, and genetics, and molecular bio virology, cancer virology, childhood leukemia. And the reason I did so much is because I didn't really manage to stick to one thing, even while I was doing my career in science. And if you were in education, you would know, and if you were neurodivergent, you would know that sometimes if you like to do something, it doesn't always stick. And the secret is really to try as much as possible. And uh, unfortunately, I had to do it during my PhD, which um, landed in a bit of a crash, and then boom, and then come back up. And straight after my PhD, I actually came out of being a scientist um, to explore my career, or what is left of my creativity, being in education for until um, I was the age of 30. And so, within that 10 years following my exit from the lab, I landed into existential crisis. Because within these 10 years, I was um, trying every creative job there is in the industry. Like I was in a pick and mix sweet shop. So I try a little bit of these because I like a bit of, you know, writing, and then I do a bit of acting and um, maybe I'll do a bit of communicating. <laughs> and so everything that I did, you know, it felt like it was aimless. So often I was at this place, you know, wondering what am I doing with my life? And I think if you have so many interests and you couldn't really bring it all together and there was no one to tell you how, and then you couldn't really afford a coach. <laughs> so then you kind of wander along on your own, you know, in existential anxiety. And it was not only after I became a mother, raising small children and to take some time away from career. And then eventually, when the pandemic hit, everything just felt too much, because I had my second child, and it wasn't just the second child. Your extra child, it's like extra 10 children. For someone who is ADHD, but also autistic, have you heard of this concept called monotropic split? That is something I had to learn the hard way, and I didn't even know what it is. It is something that children who are both autistic and ADHD have to contend with in school. And that means when you have so many stimulus in your environment, you're trying to focus on this one thing. And that's why we're so good at hyper-focus. Everything goes into this one point. But then when you have so many stimulus around you, your brain literally just combusts. Because you're like, oh, which one do I concentrate first? You know, someone's talking, you know, someone's breathing. Because as a neurodivergent, what I've learned is that we experience the world through what we see, what we feel, and what we hear first. Before, how we make sense of what these things, you know, all these sensations and emotions mean to us. And that's because we have this bottom-up thinking, bottom-up feeling approach, you know, and the neural pathways that is involved in our sensory inputs is so much stronger than the ones that help us process our thoughts and emotions. And in some ways, this lends us to a lot of strength, you know, to actually understanding what is it about this situation that I need to, you know, get to the bottom of. Well, how do I solve this problem? And um, which one of you here are creatives? Creatives, what do you do? Writers, artists, scientists, or do you do, like, what, what, what sort of creative work do you do? Uh, I used to be a brand designer and brand strategist. Amazing. And Jack? Yeah, I'm not creative as a job, so I just like being creative at home, music and all that sort of stuff. Brilliant. A boring job. But you know, I know you work in business development and you are creative in the way that you know what people want. And then you kind of like try and tailor, you know, the message, you know, to kind of get them on board. You know, because creativity is not just creating, you know, things on paper or, you know, on, on brush strokes, but it's also the way you solve problems, right? What was I saying this point for? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was talking about creativity, right? And that is a really, really good place to start. Do you know that the ADHD brain is inherently creative? And it is creative in the sense that 
our default mode network, the seat of our imagination, where our mind, you know, can spontaneously pop creative ideas, is switched on at the same time as the part of the brain that gets you to do the task. It's called a task positive network. So when you're doing something in school, and then you see a butterfly fluttering, you know, out the window, you will look at that because that's your, like, ooh, look at that, you know, look at the butterfly, anything that can, you know, give you more stimulation. So yeah, so that is, um, that is why the ADHD brain struggle in the mainstream school system. That is why also that when you get diagnosed with ADHD later in life, the first thing they help you with is executive functioning. But then what I also realized is after doing so much work, you know, advocating for women with ADHD and then going into the workplace to get society, get workplace on board with what neurodiversity means and how to maximize, you know, neurodivergent strengths. But actually, yeah, you know, we should all, you know, be harnessed for our strength and our potential. But then what if we already want to do that and we don't need extra encouragement in order to work harder? It is what people are wanting more now of neurodivergence because we want people who do really well, you know, can solve problems, who can, you know, bring a different way of seeing things to the workplace. But then the message that is being perpetuated also is that if you're autistic, you can work 200% harder than anyone else. And if you're an ADHD, or, you know, you can create these ideas, you know, that will just be like mind blowing for everyone. And so when you go into the workplace with these kind of like expectations, people are like, oh, I, we employed you now, what can you do? What's your special skill? What's your strength? <laughs> and we're like, do something, you know, show us your superpower. <laughs> That's great, right? But then, you know, I'm also really prone to burnout. <laughs> so you take the good with the bad. And all my work is about telling people that actually we are just humans. And at the end of the day, you know, it is about humanizing anyone who are different, who seem different. Because at the end of the day, whether or not you're neurodivergent, we all struggle with some things in life. And that is, that, that begins with your place in society, how you were nurtured, you know, to begin with. How your parents were nurtured, you know, the generational trauma that they passed down through the bloodline. And then your place in society. Where did you land up in society? Okay, were you, did you grow up in an area that was deprived? Did you grow up in a privileged area? Or did you come from a class, you know, or a race that would separate you from the main population? And you would know that because when people create policies and people create, you know, the way of doing things or culture in your workplace, it is always to serve the population that created those policies. And so part of my work is to help people see that whether neurodivergent is a strength or disability really depends on your experience, you know? So some of us may have, you know, ADHD and see it as a superpower, but some of us actually have it, you know, and see it as a disability. And so where do we reconcile this, you know, with society? I think once I posted uh, something very flippantly, I did it at 1 a.m., I said, is ADHD is a disability? Let's change that, shall we? And the next morning I woke up and I realized I totally got jumped on. Thou shall not say anything about ADHD and disability in social media because we should not say that it's not a disability because if we do say it, then people are not going to give us the reasonable adjustments. People are not going to give us extra support. But... Really, the reality is that why is it a disability, right? So I sat on it and then came back with a poll and asked people instead, why do you, do you see your neurodivergence as a disability? And I gave them the option, you know, yes, because of societal structure, um, yes, because of intersectionality, yes, for other reasons, or no. And I think 30... 5%, you know, said no, they don't see it. And that's also LinkedIn. And I think it's probably a fairly privileged, you know, position, sorry. Stutter is one of my neurodivergence, beautiful, you know, strengths. So, 65% um, <laughs> actually don't see it. Um, well, actually, 65% see it as a disability, but only because of societal structure. So when we break it down, right, yes, we... It is a disability because society isn't fit for purpose. 
So what is um, the next step then? Do we create a world where it is ready for us? A world where we are seen as equals, we're not second class citizens, you know? Um, these, this world is starting to be made through FOMO. Um, if anyone follows neurodiversity in business, they've managed to get a lot of corporate partners on board and it's strictly because other people are doing it. <laughs> um, all of my time now is spent agonizing over why should they care? And that's why a lot of the work I do is around neurodiversity and integration. And I know people might describe integration in different ways, but I see it as a way for us to get in and then change things. Yeah, so back to my last call to action, I suppose, is why should people care? First of all, people would care if it makes them look bad if they don't care. <laughs> Secondly, they would care if they have children, grandchildren, grand, grand, great-grandchildren who are neurodivergent and they want to prepare the world for them. Uh, thirdly, also, if they have superhero complex. <laughs> and fourthly, if they're late diagnosed in life as a neurodivergent and actually want to prepare the world for their children. This is kind of what I want to do. Thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to be here.